Disc brakes are almost universally adopted in modern high-speed braking technology and usually incorporate some form of anti-lock or wheel slide protection device to ensure minimum stopping distances in conditions of low adhesion. We can see the application of this technology in jet passenger aircraft like the Boeing 747, in ABS brakes like those of the Sierra Cosworth, in the world's fastest train, the TGV, and in the latest generation of multiple unit trains on British Rail. The reasoning behind the adoption of the disc brake is simple. Whereas the friction, that is to say the ability to dissipate energy, of the tread brake climbs steeply at low speed, at high speed this ability is greatly reduced. A comparison between the friction curve of the cast iron tread brake and the virtual straight line of the disc shows this very clearly. Because of the efficiency of the disc brake in its ability to give high rates of retardation, wheel slide protection equipment is fitted to adjust the braking effort on each individual axle up to the maximum that the wheel rail adhesion can sustain. The disc brake is actuated by a three-step electrically controlled automatic air brake giving three stages of braking up to full service. This braking demand is consistent on each vehicle of the train irrespective of load by virtue of load sensing devices. It is important to remember therefore that the braking performance of the train will not vary given the same adhesion conditions, irrespective of whether it is loaded or empty. An emergency position is provided to ensure that the brake is applied in the unlikely event of an electrical failure. On some types of unit, and on all future builds, additional brake force is provided in this position. The emergency position must not, however, be used in normal service braking. When making a service brake application in good rail adhesion conditions, the driver should select step 3 at his known braking point. The brake controller should be moved directly to this position without pausing in either steps 1 or 2. Only when the speed of the train has been significantly reduced does he ease the brake to step 2 or 1 according to the train and platform length and the prevailing gradient. Immediately before the train comes to a stand, he should select step 1 to ensure the train is brought to a halt without a jerk. Don't make this final easing of the brake too soon or the train will overrun the stopping point. The nature of disc brakes makes it easier to achieve a smooth stop than with cast iron tread brakes. If the rail condition is known to be poor, for example where it is contaminated with leaf resin in the autumn or by industrial pollutants, brake earlier. Such conditions will always increase the braking distance. Select the brake step you judge to be appropriate for the prevailing conditions. Let the wheel slide protection operate. It will react more quickly than you can and heavy WSP activity at the front of the train will assist in the conditioning of the rail for wheel sets in the rear. Don't be tempted to partially release the brake when you hear WSP activity. You will simply extend your stopping distance. Once the speed of the train has been significantly reduced, the driver may ease the brake as he did for his normal service stop. Be careful, however, and make your approach more slowly than in normal rail conditions. Braking points are a normal part of a driver's route knowledge, as are gradients. You should also know where poor rail conditions are likely to be encountered at certain times of the year. For example, during the autumn months, where the line runs through wooded areas. When conditions require you to brake earlier, use your judgement and experience. As a guide, if running at 75 miles per hour, you may need to commence braking some 300 yards earlier. At 90 miles per hour, as much as 500 yards earlier. Don't forget that the erratic speedometer reading and brake cylinder gauge activity only indicate what is happening on the bogey beneath your cab, not what is happening behind you, where less WSP activity may be taking place.
Let's have another look at braking in very poor adhesion conditions, particularly at the action of the wheel slide protection devices. In this case, the rail head has been contaminated with a soapy lubricant. The driver makes his brake application, selecting step 3. WSP activity commences at the head end of the train and we can hear the blowdown valves actuating. A test rig in the train monitors WSP activity on each axle and we can see how quickly each wheel set responds. Each light on the test display represents one axle of the train. Should the driver attempt to manually compensate for the tendency to slide, he simply confuses the WSP equipment, reducing its efficiency and, inevitably, extending his braking distance. It is for this reason that the driver should maintain step 3 braking in these circumstances until the train has been brought to a slow speed. In poor rail conditions, brake earlier, even if it means losing time. Don't run the risk of overrunning a platform or, worse still, a signal at danger. Of course, it is possible to encounter very poor rail conditions unexpectedly, leaving no opportunity for earlier braking. In this case, the driver selects step three. Keep the brake fully applied and let the WSP do its job. WSP activity at the head end is permitting a controlled slide. The wheels are still rotating, but at a slower speed than their passage over the rail. This controlled slide is conditioning the rail for successive wheel sets to grip. Again, if the driver reduces the braking step, he will increase his braking distance. If an emergency stop is called for, the driver moves the brake controller immediately to the emergency position and leaves it there until the train has come to a stand. Certain units are fitted with WSP override push buttons on the driving desk. These should only be used in cases of extreme emergency and where there is very heavy WSP activity. Even in these circumstances, the driver should not operate the WSP override at high speed. Such action at high speed will not reduce the braking distance and may cause extensive damage to both train and track. If the WSP override push button is operated, it will isolate the WSP equipment for a period of two minutes. And during this time, it will not be possible to release the brake. The WSP override will only function with the brake controller in emergency. And although brake pressure may be reduced by selecting steps two or one, the selection of release will provoke a full application. If the WSP override push button is depressed for a second time, it will add a further two minutes to the release delay. WSP activity should not take place at speeds less than six miles per hour. If it does, you should report it. Here's Brian Nicholas, the board's brake engineer, to explain some of the technical considerations. Why have I, as the brake engineer, made certain engineering decisions which affect the performance of braking on modern electric multiple units. Well first of all let's take the brake control system. The three-step electrically controlled automatic air brake was chosen because it offered simplicity and a higher degree of reliability than the old automatic EP brake which you're probably familiar with from stock built in the 1950s and 1960s. Because with a modern EMU we want to obtain a consistent stopping distance performance irrespective of the passenger load that you are carrying, we can modify the three-step brake by including variable load control. All this simply does is ensure that each brake under each vehicle is given a fair contribution to the energy dissipation when you demand a degree of retardation. 
Why did we select the disc brake instead of the tread brake? Well, quite simply, with the introduction of higher speeds, higher rates of retardation, frequent station stops, the disc brake is technically superior to the tread brake and offers and meets the consistent stopping distance performance which I've referred to earlier. Why do we fit wheel slide protection? Well, those of you who will recollect the Class 310s when they were introduced will remember that they were not fitted with such devices. And as such, they soon encountered considerable wheel set damage. They encountered this damage because adhesion varies throughout the year and, as you now, is particularly low in the autumn. And so, in order to ensure that a wheel set doesn't suffer serious damage, which results in the unit being taken out of service, it's necessary to fit this system, which will utilise the prevailing adhesion to the maximum possible extent, and at the same time, minimising the potential wheel set damage. In this film we hope to have answered some of the questions you've raised and in so doing help you to a better understanding of the three-step brake.